Back again, back again. Another episode of A Muslim and an Atheist. What are you saying, Pops? You good? I'm good, man. Uh, just want to thank everyone for watching the videos, for liking, commenting, and subscribing. As I always say, you know, we're on a journey, just trying to educate ourselves. Um, yeah, so we watched a video, a Joe Rogan clip mm. recently. And it was talking about how black people were in America, you know, before Columbus, which is obviously a, an alternate theory or unconventional to the common, you know, story that's put out there. Um, and we're talking, he was, said something about Mansa Musa, who, if you don't know, was meant to have been the richest person to ever have lived, ever. Um, so if you think this was... I'm not sure how long ago was this how long ago was this that 11th century 11th century and they still think that he was the richest person ever you have to imagine the wealth and this was um, an African empire so other than that I've heard the story of Mount Smuts over the years know who he is but don't really know too much anything to add Pops let's watch the video yeah man let's 15 Things You Didn't Know About Mansa Musa Welcome to ALUX.com, the place where future billionaires come to get informed. Hello ALUXers, today we're embarking on a trip to Africa's richest empire. You've probably never heard of it, so let's spread some light. The Mali Empire ruled the African continent back in the 14th century. Under the command of Mansa Musa, they were one of the greatest empires of that time. Although it was not the biggest, like the Roman Empire, they were definitely a key piece economically and religiously. This time we're focusing more on their greatest ruler, Mansa Musa I. The richest man that ever lived, as some sources say. He ruled the Mali Empire for 25 years, between 1312 and 1337, and led them into prosperity and serious development. There weren't many African empires, but the Mali Empire was one of the most important. Mansa Musa was a very important emperor and conqueror of that time, and he's still remembered to this day for all of his achievements and most of all, his lavish lifestyle and wealth. If you're new here, welcome. Be sure to subscribe and follow us on Instagram at Alux. But enough with the rambling on. Let's see what life was like for a rich and famous emperor in Africa 700 years ago. Number 1. He ruled parts of modern-day Mauritania, Senegal, Gambia, Guinea, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, and Chad. For those not familiar with the Mali Empire and Mansa Musa I, here's a short flip through their history. The Mali Empire dates back from 1230 to 1670, which makes up almost 500 years of battles, conquests, problems, prosperity, and so on. They were the largest African empire and the main influence of the whole West African region. At their peak, the Mali Empire, or Madden as some call them, ruled over regions or parts of modern-day Mauritania, Senegal, Gambia, Guinea, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, and Chad. They developed over time, starting out as a small city along the Niger River, and quickly took over lands and cities to establish one of the biggest Islamic empires of Africa. Nowadays, the remnants of what the Mali Empire used to be can be found in books, some traditions, culture, and architecture. Number 2. He Conquered Over 24 Cities Mansa Musa took the throne after his predecessor died. He was the first ruler from the Lay lineage and the man that established the empire as a true Islamic state. However, he did not force or impose anyone to adopt the faith he believed in. His entire adult life was dedicated to his job as emperor, ruler, and conqueror. In order to keep the empire at bay and stable, he conquered over 24 cities in 10 countries from West Africa. His military actions were intense at some times and very consistent. 
he seized quite a bit of the region, including some parts of the Sahara Desert, so you can imagine his kingdom was rich, and with that land and wealth, everyone started to learn about him. Fast forward hundreds of years into 2018, and we still remember him. Other than Napoleon, Julius Caesar, or Alexander the Great, there are not many men out there that conquered so many cities. Number 3. He Founded the First University in the Region as we mentioned before, Mansa Musa was not your typical emperor. He made sure that his kingdom was prosperous, safe, and large. He was an avid Islamic believer, but at the same time, a promoter for education and learning. In his travels and battles, he learned the importance of development and innovation, so he founded the first university in Timbuktu. He started huge building programs raising mosques and madrasa. I didn't know that was where Timbuktu was, Mali. Mm -hmm. That's got to be the most, well, it's the first, it was the first ever university. One of the, definitely the first ever universities. This is the bit she said, made it sound like it was common practice. There yeah, were universities yeah. everywhere. People they used were, to go there from all over the world, and of course, Timbuktu. Of course, that's why we know about Timbuktu, but mm -hmm. no one knows about Timbuktu, they just know the name. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. But yeah, yeah, Cordova was the other university. This is where the era of enlightenment for Europe came from. Mm. It was a beast, to be fair. 24 cities. His, his region was huge as well. Well, it? you know, somewhere in there, she said, he became the first Muslim ruler for Mali. Right? You heard that? Okay. And then... He didn't force anybody to convert to Islam. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Now, if he was the head of an army, then he would follow Islamic Islamic guidance about warfare, so he would have to announce the war and declare and do certain things as per the Muslim tradition. So I don't think he was rampaging through Africa and stuff, you know. <laughs> It wasn't war on that basis. They would only fight war where they had to fight war, but yeah, there were yeah, conditions yeah. and there were the way that Muslims, you know, do warfare from today's concept of warfare is different. Okay. educational institutions in Arab that climaxed with the building of the university at Sankor, where they brought in jurists, astronomers, and mathematicians, as well as Islamic professors. The university became a center of learning and arts, with Muslim students coming from around Africa and the Middle East. They had the largest collection of books in Africa since the Library of Alexandria burned, with over one million manuscripts and the capacity of housing 25,000 students. Number 4. His empire was the largest gold producer in the world. With great knowledge and power comes great fortune. The Mali Empire had a huge advantage of residing along the Niger River and the Niger Delta. Every successful empire started out with a good river because water means life, food and trade. That's exactly what they did to prosper. They traded salt and gold to others while growing crops and sustaining life. By the time he became the emperor of Mali and began conquering more and more territories, more and more people had already heard about him and his kingdom. With a good location and opening up to the Atlantic Ocean, they managed to turn Mali into one of the biggest trading regions in the world. They were selling gold and salt at a time where Europe was struggling to obtain and hold both of them. Opportunity surely was their best weapon. Number 5. He became the... Let's say where the gold came from. Did it say along by the river? Well, it said, you know, they started by the river, but I didn't hear where the gold mines were or nothing. That's what I was expecting to say. Well, there were two major gold mines here. That didn't explain where the gold came from. It just said they were selling salt and gold. Yeah. So the assumption is that they actually earned their money through trade yeah, and yeah, not yeah, from yeah. gold mines. And they became super, super rich. So he's the richest man ever from selling that, from, from trade. trade no gold mines. Mm, interesting concept, don't you think?
Yeah, you usually hear that it's that Mali just had enough gold in it. So what There's was the European conquest really. of Africa, or wasn't it, for <laughs> riches and gold well, what, and stuff? What was I, what I was going to say, watch, the talks about, like, the gold, but does Mali have gold today? Are there still gold mines, like, active in Mali now? Has it been, like, stripped? I think Mali's kind of in a state of change, shall we say, at the moment. Mm-hmm. A lot of... You know, like I say, there's a lot of strange things that happen in Africa. Like me say, it's a normal thing, then all of a sudden Boko Haram or some some particular group yeah, yeah, manifest yeah. who, you know, <laughs> they're not even in that country until then. So strange things happen. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, the colonists like the French, if them want to do something, them tend to be very bitter and draw them army and concrete the waterworks yeah, yeah. and the terrible things to get them away with these people. So who knows what's there? They've been plundering since then, from then till now. Who knows what's left? But is it a rich, is it a rich country though, Mali or not? <laughs> no, I don't know. It's because we know like Nigeria is a rich country. Isn't it? If you're saying, like, if we're going to talk about, like, I think... Well, Nigeria used to be a part of Mali, innit? it? Mm. He used to rule the Mali yeah, Empire yeah, yeah, went yeah. right round West Africa and up to Chad. Mm. That's Chad is by Sudan. Yeah, yeah. He became the richest man to ever live with a net worth of over $400 billion. Trading with gold and owning so much land made Mansa Musa the richest emperor of the Mali Empire and the richest man that ever lived. His wealth is estimated to have been around $400 billion, which is four times the net worth of Jeff Bezos, the richest man today. Some people consider him the richest man in the world because most sources from that time ranked him that way. We'll never precisely know if he was really that rich or not. It's kind of impossible. But keeping in mind all the achievement we listed so far, it doesn't seem that far-fetched. I mean, just wait until you hear about the extravagant things he did and how he traveled and you be the judge of his fortune. Number 6. Like all big people in history, he had some haters too. When you're famous and loved by many people, you're bound to have a couple of haters as well. You can't possibly please everyone, and that's when the problems begin. Mansa Musa was well known in his kingdom and throughout Africa. He was rich, fierce, powerful, and a luxury lover. He always traveled in style, wearing the finest and most expensive clothing. In his pilgrimage to Mecca, he stayed in Egypt where he spent a lot of money and caused some serious damage. Besides that, he almost feuded with the Sultan al Nasir because Mansa Musa was too critical of him. Nothing bad happened between them, but they were both close to bursting. Keep in mind that diplomacy and religion never play nicely together. Number 7. His massive fortune was dismantled after two generations. When you have as much money as Mansa Musa had, over $400 billion, it seems impossible to spend it all. No matter how much you build and travel, there are still billions to spend, and if you invest that money, like most rich people do, the net worth is bound to grow year after year. However, unfortunately for Mansa Musa's descendants, the fortune was somehow dismantled in less than 100 years. The two generations that followed him weren't able to control their spending, the wars and invasions that followed, so it all went downhill. After his pilgrimage, it's no surprise that everyone came upon them to get their hands on the gold, especially Europeans, which were facing harsh famine and poverty at the time. Number 8. The date of his death is... Can you imagine that, though? Two generations after you got, you got 400 billion, and it only took two generations. To do what? To be spent. Who said he spent it? Well, actually, no, sorry. Some of it got stolen. But dismantled anyway. But 400 billion. The story of Mansa Musa is that he put gold on ships and sent them to America. Okay. So 
you know, and where she did he said live, he goes. Did he live in America at all? Or was he just sending? I don't know that. But this is what, when they send people to mm-hmm. the Americas, it was ships, how many? 200 ships with gold, just laid, just stacked with gold. So this is what I said. A lot of the artifacts, the gold found for mm-hmm. Inca gold was actually African gold. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And stuff like that, which confounded them at the time because they were looking for mines, but the gold wasn't from there. It was brought across. Um, yeah, go on, go on. Still unknown. Mansa Musa was the 10th ruling sultan of the Mali Empire. He was a beloved emperor and one of the most important figures in the history of the continent. A dedicated Muslim, he brought in many Arab storytellers and historians to have their story written for prosperity and generations to come. The biggest problem with this was that his death date is now on- So, he's a dedicated Muslim, all these good things and what did he spend his gold and lavish things? He gave away so much money is how the story goes for Egypt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He gave away so much gold that it crashed the thing. He went to Hajj. Everybody's supposed to be focusing on and there wasn't there was rushing to get the gold from him. To get the gold, yeah. You understand? So yeah, he caused damage to the natural order because he was so generous beyond any normal man. But was he being generous just like being a good Muslim? Was he generous? It says he was a good Muslim. Mm -hmm. So his people weren't poor. He just gave gold, his horses dripping. It was just dripping in gold, (laughs) which is why the Europeans from that Hajj, that was it. The new then. That was was it. So they put him on a map. (laughs) And it's that a bit was like the center uh, of the world. It's a, it's a bit like when, you know, Frank White, an American gangster, mm. goes to the, uh, the boxing, the, the boxing with the, the coat. The fire coat. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. chee-chee. Absolutely. Like, yeah. And that, that's, a, that's a good analogy. <laughs> now unknown, or at least debatable, there's a gap period between 1325 and 1337 in which historians can't tell when he actually died. Some say it was right after his pilgrimage. Some say it was after his son took the throne. Multiple sources means multiple theories. Number nine. He went on an extravagant and expensive pilgrimage for two years to Mecca. One of the most famous things Mansa Musa is known for doing is the expansion of the Mali Empire and his pilgrimage to Mecca. As a Muslim, you have to go at least once in your life to Mecca, so he did as the Quran says. His pilgrimage to Mecca took two years because they didn't have modern means of transportation to get there, 4,000 miles away from home. He took 1,000 attendants, 100 camels loaded with gold, plenty of the emperor's own personal musicians, and 500 slaves bearing gold staffs. His epic pilgrimage was done in style and suited for an emperor, of course. It simply would not have been royal enough to take a modest carriage to Mecca. This shows again just how rich he actually was. Number 10. He built the unique mosque of Jingera Ber, which still stands today. One of the landmarks that still stands today as proof of his existence is the unique mosque of Jingera Ber, which was completed in 1327 the ancient Mali city close to the Niger River. The whole construction took over two years to finalize and What do you think? You know, we talk about structures like that and mm. then being built in that time. How was it done? Do we feel the same way about that as we do the pyramids? <laughs> in, in just in general or... I think that's not really a building, though, is it? It's a, a timber frame with You mud. know how it's made. Yeah. Whereas, you know how it's made, and it? Yeah. So it's not the in same, terms right? of Ingenuity. In terms of architectural design, it's different. So it stands out, and I can see the architect. Oh, why, you know? Mm-hmm. These Stone Age people built this type of thing, but... It's just a look at it, wood sticking out. But every year they got to go and put new mud on it. And there are rituals that go with keeping that building up. But in Africa, 
you can build a mud hut and live in it for a hundred years. It doesn't fall down or fall apart. Mm. It's only modern day huts. They use cement and sand. Yeah. They used to use straw. They have different systems. So that was just them systems being utilized to the finest. Mm -hmm. Approximately 45 kilograms of gold, aka $1.7 million. The man behind the design was paid 200 kilograms of gold for his work. The building is now part of the University of Timbuktu and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Since it's so old and made out of natural elements, the building is in danger due to sand erosion. The mosque was also subject of a terrorist attack in 2012 by the Defenders of Faith, who claim that the shrine is a sin and therefore should be destroyed. And Alexers, if you're interested in learning some more about another African billionaire, why not click in the top right corner to watch our video, The 15 Things You Didn't Know About Aliko Dangote. Number 11. They said the mosque is a shrine mm. to Mansa. So they're saying basically uh, Muslims said that the mosque or the university is a shrine. Mm -hmm. So they tried to destroy it because mm. they thought that people were worshipping Mansa like he was a prophet, basically. Mm. That's interesting. I'm going to say... That's interesting. You know, strange things happen in these countries that are not consistent with the people. But when, as a, you know, like me say, the natural system of Africa, I think, is to create people and then leave Africa and, <laughs> and go abroad. Okay. So when they become indoctrinated with other stupidness, they bring it home. And, you know, terrorism in Africa is not an African concept. You know, there's lots of things in Africa which is not African and sponsored externally. What do you mean, though? Because surely terrorism is just... Two tribes going to war could be considered terrorism. But two tribes don't just go to war. Yeah, obviously there's going to be some fact to why they go. Right, them and there's happen, lots and of structures like... in place that have been there for hundreds of years to mitigate that them don't just go to war. They That's what I'm saying, that war, no, the concept of war definitely exists, has existed in African history. Um, before so tell me, I would tell me then, before which religion. nations were conquered by Africa? What do you mean, which nations? The concept of war existed there a long time, so which nations but, but have been conquered? I'm saying, I'm not talking about nations, I'm talking about when people just had tribes there was no nations. I'm talking about from man. I think war has been around since man has been around. I think if you've had two groups of people, I feel like there's going to have been some conflict somewhere, especially when they could communicate. Maybe when they couldn't talk to each other, it might not have happened. But as soon as communication happened, there must have been conflict. Why? I don't know. I just think that's human nature. I feel like human nature is to... I'm going to go with the opposite it's call. Like, it's definitely not human nature. Do you know what I mean? You know. You don't know think survival being like, like a, I wouldn't say predator because I'm not killing people, but our survival instinct, it's like groups, it's naturally like. Our, our seek, survival seek, instincts seek group, and destroy. Group. No. No, we used to live in villages and communities that sought to do things together to survive. Now we live in cities with blocks and individual and capitalist thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, lots of people come from small villages. They, they weren't rich, but they were happy and brought up well and yeah, saved your money. I don't think it's anything to Save your money. money. May I go give us an example? Go on. You understand? My perfect example mm -hmm. of someone who grew up disadvantaged but with a gift and mm -hmm. the will to pursue it, well, instinct. And like me say, on arriving where he was journeying to, you know, his, he may change over time, but the upbringing in him, shine is like a light and everybody loves Sadio money. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's not one person. I'm talking about like when there's groups and so mm -hmm. if you've got, a, like one person can shine it, and I get that my name's been there. And I think that's like individual. But 
I think when you've got groups of people, then there becomes conflict with other groups of people. I think whether that's over resources, whether it's over uh, shelter, women, resources basically, everything's a resource isn't it? in them things. So yeah, you're right, maybe that's just my way of thinking, but I would naturally think, and I'm not saying that people are just warring and killing each other, but it's the same as today, isn't it? Like, you could have two groups of people who are perfectly fine. One person from that group can just slide someone in that group without mm -hmm. everyone even knowing. Then mm -hmm. there's conflicts. So that's naturally what it is. I think terrorism is obviously a bit different. I don't know. Again, i got to stop you there. Let's say you have two groups of people. Mm -hmm. And then, for whatever reason, someone injures someone in the other group. Mm -hmm. But I don't think the two groups just run at each other straight after that. There no, tends no, no, to no. be a moment of either someone hyping it up and creating the scenario. Yeah, I'm not saying like or, people are savages and they're just running out chopping people right. out because that happens. But so these things escalate, and, it, and things they can escalate. can escalate quickly. where there are no structures to prevent it escalating. But, but if you have an organised society where that isn't the norm, mm -hmm then it doesn't escalate like that. It goes to the elders and it goes to this. And you understand? They had a structure, each village, the Akalus, the this, the chiefs. These weren't just names. They were structures like, you know, police and this and that mm -hmm. in this society. So it, society had structure. It just wasn't this society. And this yeah, society yeah, yeah, yeah. presents it as though there was nothing there. It was just void of any... You know, well, and that's but that's that's not the same thing. I don't think saying it was void of structure. I do think there was structure, but I also think that that's why there was people, all there. But no, because that's not necessarily the two things don't necessarily go hand in hand. Like because the problem in in your equation or uh, story is people. People break structure. You get people who bend, break, coerce get other people to do stuff. And that does happen a lot. You get them, like no matter how well structured society is, you're always gonna have outliers, always. Mm. You can't get rid of them. Mm. So I'm saying even back then when there was structure, I, there still would have been war. I, I think there still would have been war. Let's, let's get, let's <laughs> move on, I'm just saying it. 2018 for African people might be the fact that Mansa Musa's life could be turned into a movie. The famous Ryan Coogler and Michael B. Jordan are joining forces to bring the life and story of Mansa Musa I to the screen. It's a contribution to the black community and a tribute to the great emperor and the richest man in the world. This duo has some great movies behind them and have been working together for quite some time now. Their film will most probably focus on the pilgrimage to Mecca, the number 12. His empire was a very safe place for anyone. Nowadays, people avoid traveling in some parts of the world because of crime rates, violence, and war. Here we are in 2018 and we still can't enjoy all the marvelous places, cultures, and regions of the world because it's simply not safe. Back in the 14th century, things weren't so different either, except for the Mali Empire. Ibn Battuta, a renowned Moroccan traveler writer who traveled extensively through Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, was highly impressed by the peace and security he experienced during his visit in Mali because it was a very safe territory. Travelers, visitors, citizens, and traders were living peacefully because robbers and violent people were shown no mercy. Radical measures do pay off sometimes, but we don't live in the medieval era anymore. Number 13. He was included in the Catalan Atlas. Mansa Musa's pilgrimage to Mecca was the event that made him famous all over the world. After people heard how he traveled and how he spent his money, they wanted to know him, see him, and make business with him. Of course, there were also some that wanted to rob him because he had a lot of gold and precious minerals. He was included in the famous Catalan Atlas in 1375, one of the most important world maps of medieval Europe. He also sparked a lot of controversy and interest for the Spanish, Portuguese, and Germans. 
He shaped the entire European view of Mali as a place of splendor, wealth, and sophistication they could get their hands on. Number 14. His spending led to the gold inflation in Egypt. We mentioned that his pilgrimage to Mecca was quite a travel expense and news to the world. It got him very far, but it also affected some parts of Africa, too. Some stories mention he used to gift his travel companions and unfortunate ones. There's a quote mentioning that, At each halt, he would regale us with rare foods and confectionery. His equipment and furnishings were carried by 12,000 private slave women, wearing gowns of brocade and Yemeni silk. Another story of his travel puts him into financial difficulties. Due to his spending and donations in Egypt, he actually caused mass inflation on the market. It took the city of Cairo years to fully recover from the currency crisis Mansa Musa created during his stay. That's the real Wolf of Wall Street right there. Number 15. Some people compare him with Chala from Black Panther. Since he was African, the only resemblance they could find was Chala from Black Panther. The Marvel movie was highly successful, so we understand where the comparison comes from. So, let's break it down. They both protected their land and their precious resources. They both built a lot and invested in education. They were both envied by others, and they're both still famous way after their career ended. Maybe Black Panther will get some more squeals and cameos so he can win over Mansa Musa and his great newfound reputation. After all the comparisons and billions we mentioned here, we bet you're motivated to go out there and do your best to make your first million. We've seen that history shows us again and again how some of the richest people made the same mistakes or choices. It's easy to... Yeah, so 15 things you didn't know about Mansa Musa. What do you think, Dad? Worth knowing, if you into African history. Mm -hmm. I wonder, like, obviously, Mansa Musa is probably like the most, the most famous uh, African emperor, yeah, or king, whichever you want to say. But who are in who's Europe? Is was... <laughs> the most famous African emperor in Europe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But who else would you say is that like, had an empire like that then, or? Don't know, being like a yeah, good, all good the leader. other mansas before him would have had an empire like that in it. Not necessarily. <laughs> Why not? Because the empire build, of Mali. But didn't he build that? Didn't he go and conquer all the other cities to make it the empire? First, it was just would it just been like the small one place in it? Then didn't he go out and well, conquer? Well, that's what they said. It started by the river Niger and then it expanded, Spread out, it? right? And then they introduced the concept of conflict for it to spread out whereas food and man looking after your goodies one way of spreading so 100 percent. and religious affiliation they said he didn't compel anybody to become muslims but the whole region became Come islamic mm -hmm. i would think that's because the muslims are generous he was generous he was kind why wouldn't you want to be like him yeah you know, if he was have so successful and his God look after him like that, isn't that the driving force? So he didn't compel anybody and he was generous to everybody. You know, so like, in my view of Africa and the village thing, where people looked after people and there was an order, I don't, you know, my experience of Africa, again, I go and experience, there is, it's different to here. Mm -hmm. They becoming like here, but it's different to here. Me, capitalistic. Yes, yeah, very in their views and their desire for money and trinkets mm -hmm. and beads. You know, and the greed, like Mister, they'll end up selling off Africa just to get the money. Know, whereas land is <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely king. <laughs> Okay, so that was 15 things you didn't know about Mansa Musa. Again, thank you for watching the video. Like, comment, subscribe. Tell us what you want us to do next. Um, anything to add, Pops? No, I'm good. All right, then. We out. Peace. Peace.